Thanks for listening to the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. I'm here to help educate, motivate, and put you on the right path to take control of your health through weekly discussions on topics in the medical field, public health arena, and in your community. And now your host, Dr. Barry. And welcome to another episode of the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. I'm your host, Dr. Barry Pierre, your favorite board certified internist, host of the number one podcast for patient advocacy, helping you empower yourself for better health. This week, we bring you episode 93. And this week, we have an amazing guest, Dr. Sylvia Boley, who is a dual certified, dual board certified internal medicine physician, as well as obesity medicine specialist. And you may also know her as America's favorite obesity doctor. She helps inspire optimal health through honesty and hope. So Dr. Sylvia Boley has lost 40 pounds through overcoming emotional eating and physical activity. She has both personal and professional expertise in weight loss as well as weight maintenance, which on this episode you're going to learn is just as important as losing weight. As a working mom, wife, and self-professed foodie, she keenly understands the limitations that prevents busy people like most of us from achieving our health goals. She is passionate about helping busy people, especially working women, attain and maintain their happiness and their happy and healthy weight. You are going to be able to follow her on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook for all lifestyle and motivational uh, tips and techniques. And again, uh, and like always, if you want today's show notes, head over to lunchlearnpod.com and you'll get the show notes for uh, today's episode. If you have not had a chance, remember to subscribe to the podcast. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, remember to leave me a five-star review, as well as some comments and let me know that you did it so I can give you a shout out. Uh, Let's listen to episode 93 with Dr. Sylvia Boley. This episode is brought to you by the Lunch and Learn Community Store, where we are living out the motto, empower yourself for better health. In the Lunch and Learn Community Store, you can get your favorite t-shirts, e-books, as well as other related products by Dr. Barry. Head over to shop.drpiersblog.com and get a chance to get 10% off your first purchase by using the coupon code EMPOWER10. Again, shop.drpiersblog.com. Live out the motto, empower yourself for better health. And again, thank you, Lunch and Learn community, for joining us for another amazing episode here. Uh, I have America's obesity doctor, Dr. Sylvia Boley. She is going to educate us and really school us on what obesity really means, uh, why it's so important, and kind of going along with the theme of our New Year's resolution and getting healthier of course, a lot of it usually stems around losing weight. And I thought I would be doing you guys a disservice if I did not get an expert at just that. All right. Um, Dr. Sidney Bowley, first of all, again, thank you for coming on to the show today. Well, thank you, Dr. Barry, for having me. It's an honor to be on here. I appreciate all the work you do for the community. Appreciate and keeping it. everyone informed. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I gave I gave a formal introduction, but if if you would just tell you know, tell the lunch learner listeners, like, like who's Dr. Sylvia Boley? Like, if they were just kind of passing along the street and they wanted to know, like, who really is America's obesity doctor? All right. Well, that's a great question. So I am, I, I'm a human being, first and foremost. I'm a real person. <laughs> I like food. <laughs> I grew up in a family of caterers. Um, my parents owned a restaurant, actually. So I just grew up with food. And I grew up in the South in Atlanta, um, Georgia is where I'm from originally. Um, so, but my professional credentials, as, you, as you've already said, I'm internal, I was an internal medicine physician. And um, that's how I started my training. Oh, about a few years into it, I realized that pretty much everything I was doing came back around to weight. Like whether I was treating high blood pressure it came down to the weight and the lifestyle. Whether I was treating diabetes, it came down to weight and lifestyle. So so I'm treating these things and seeing it all has a lot of tie-ins with weight and obesity, which I will define for you guys what we mean when we say obesity, because a lot of people have misconceptions about that. But so it all came down to that. And at the same time, 
personally, I was going through my own weight challenge. Um, I had had my first child in at the end of residency. Um, it was a very stressful time between residency and chief year. I gained 60 pounds actually with the pregnancy and um, retained about 40 of that for two years due to stress eating. So it got to the point I'm treating these people for their um, obesity and obesity related um, conditions like diabetes, high blood pressures, even some cancers, you know, and I'm then I'm trying to talk to them about their lifestyle. And meanwhile, I was not living the lifestyle I was telling people about. And I was, I actually met criteria for obesity. So I started to feel very convicted. So I would literally be like, I would just tell them, I have, what are you eating? And then I would hear the voice say, well, what are you eating for lunch? <laughs> like, when was it last time? You, how much exercise did you get us here? When did you last exercise? So it started to affect me teaching my patients. And there's actually studies that show that doctors who are obese or who have obesity, I'm sorry, is the correct terminology, um, are less likely to diagnose their patients with obesity and to treat their obesity. So I was starting to actually manifest that statistic. So that really put me on, and that was about in 2000, the end of 2014, early 2015. So I started my own personal weight loss journey and I learned a lot about obesity and weight in general. And that prompted me to go and get my board certification in obesity medicine, because that's how I learned that there was actually more medical training. So through that, I feel I became America's obesity doctor, not because I know everything about obesity or I am a Harvard researcher or anything like that. Certainly, I have colleagues who I really admire who know a lot. They've been in obesity medicine a long time, a lot longer than me. But for me, I think um, I feel like the America's obesity doctor because I'm here for everyone. And my goal or my passion is to help people make get lasting weight loss through giving you the information so that you can personalize your weight loss plan for yourself as opposed to me just telling you do this do that or this is the be all end all diet because the studies just don't show that so that's a little bit about myself in terms of weight loss. I hope that answered your question. Oh, no, it, it definitely did. <laughs> and, and let me ask you, because I've talked about this before, right? Sometimes the hypocrisy of being a physician where, mm-hmm. you know, it, and, and it's funny because I'm thinking of some of, my, some of my patients right now where I've had to look them in the eye and be like, hey, you got to lose some weight. And they looked me right back. And I had, I had some funny, they had some very funny patients. They'd be like, hey, <laughs> Um, you got to lose some weight too with me. And, and it, was, it was something I was like, yeah, you know what? You're right. You are 100% correct. And, and I don't know if it's just in our training where we're able to kind of separate, you know, the faults that we are also manifesting and still trying to imply and employ mm-hmm. like, hey, patient, I need you to do this, even though mm-hmm. I'm not doing it. I'm not sure where it happens. And I, I, I'm almost sure it's not just related to medicine, but I obviously I have personal experience. Uh, of being in that same exact situation that you described. Exactly. Yeah, I think we, you know, the whether it's the white coat, it's the training, we put a veil up and almost for, I think, a long time, it was when you you go into being doctor mode, so to speak, mm-hmm. you separate yourself from the humanity, which is why I said, first and foremost, I'm a human being, right? Because we, we forget that we're humans, just like the patients that we're treating, then, and we put on this guise of like superpower to be a doctor. I think we can forget that empathy piece and even forget what needs to be done. And, and we see that a lot in obesity, where we still have have a lot of discrimination, a lot of weight bias, a lot of stigma, and it's almost acceptable. Like, so, you know, if you think about it, even in popular culture, when there are jokes being met, made or they want to cast someone as unattractive, they always, the default is obesity and there's not a lot of enough public outcry about it. Certainly there are organizations like Obesity Action Coalition, the Obesity Society, OMA, and we're trying to work to reduce that stigma, that bias, but it's still pretty acceptable. 
Um, and I think medicine, definitely, we still see it, that existing in medicine as well. Wow. Now, and we, and we obviously, we, we've talked a little bit about obesity here for uh, our lunch and listeners, because one, one thing about us, the, the community, is we always try to make it as, you know, layman, as, and I hate to say layman, but as layman as possible yeah. when we talk about these medical terms. Sure. Um, what, what if, you, if someone said, well, what, Dr. Bowley, what is obesity? Like, what is that? Mm-hmm. Is that fat? Like, what does that actually mean? <laughs> yeah, so the layman's way of thinking about it is the accumulation of fat tissue, um, which we, the medical term for that is adiposity. Um, and that's going to usually be in certain key areas and the most worrisome of which, uh, key areas of the body, the most worrisome is going to be your middle area, your middle section. The way that we measure it, so the accumulation of fat cells, um, primarily in the central region of the body, but the way that we measure it is um, three ways. That one is the body mass index, which most people are familiar with. That's going to be your that's going to be your weight in kilograms divided by um, your height in meters squared. Um, and usually if you have a BMI over 30, we say that you have obesity, the disease of obesity. Um, the other things, but that BMI in and of itself has a lot of faults. Um, and I'd love to talk about that a little later in the podcast. Oh, yeah. Um, That's definitely a question we always get like, well, someone told me you can't really trust the BMI. That's true. So well, we could talk about it. So two other more precise or more accurate measures would be waist circumference. So having a central waist circumference greater than 35 inches um, for a female would make you say that you have obesity greater than 44 male inches would be um, obesity. And then also having, and then your body fat percentage as well, um, which is also male and female specific as well, is going to diagnose you with um, obesity also. So those are the three ways that we can define it clinically. Yeah. And, and, in, and in that regard, especially as, 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 we, as we go through and we, we hear, we definitely hear it much more common, right? Just that term, the term gets thrown out there a lot, um, usually in a negative connotation. What do you say to the person who feels like, yes, yes, I'm obese, but like, what else? Like, what, what can I do? It's not my fault. Mm. Well, I would I would actually validate some of what they're saying about um and so just um to correct because we're trying to change the um terminology a little bit. Um so we don't like number one for people to refer to themselves as obese. Um just like we are changing from saying people are hypertensive or people are diabetic, right? You are, we try to say people not be, make the person be defined by the disease. So mm-hmm. we say um a man with diabetes man with, or this yep, person yep. has with um, hypertension. Same thing, a person with obesity, because obesity is a disease. Um, I like to use the Cheeto analogy is what I call it. I say, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you take a pack of Cheetos, right, um, you can have two people eat a pack of Cheetos and one person gains no weight. But for me, that's going to go straight to my thighs, to my mm-hmm. hips, you know, <laughs> like I have those certain <laughs> foods that I know are going to trigger my obesity genes. And so I say cheap pizza, sleep deprivation, and high stress. That triggers my obesity genes. So I just know certain things. Was, and same things, but I think Cheetos really drive it home to me because I had that friend, right, in college. She is skinny as a rail or thin as a rail, never gains weight. And she could wolf a pack of Cheetos goes down. And meanwhile, I would eat one, it, like just feel like I would eat five and gain weight. So I, but that all plays into the role that we now know that there are hundreds of genes that play a role in obesity of, of the actual, of giving you your weight. So how you, how much you weigh and anecdotally can say that you can see that people will say, Oh, my family is big boned, right? Mm-hmm. I'm just yep. big boned or everybody in my family is yeah, like I hear, this. I hear that so, all the time. 
Exactly. So I would, so for the person who says, oh, I'm, I have obesity and this is just how I am. Number one, I would sit, remind them that I would validate it. Yes, you are more like, more than likely based on your family history, your genetic predisposition, even your environment, growing up in certain cultures, um, growing up in certain neighborhoods, puts you more at risk for having obesity, certain parts of the country, certain parts of the world, being even here in the U.S. So I would, so you're right, you have risk factors, but at the same time, obesity is a disease. So we need to find out what is that happy, healthy weight, which is what I should aim for, for people. What is the weight that you feel happiest at? And if people are willing to put, let their guard down and stop being defensive, everyone has that weight they know that they feel like themselves at, like where your jeans fit the way you want. You look in the mirror, you like what you see. That is your happy weight, you know? Uh-huh. And, um, and then your healthy weight, what is the weight that maybe may not align with the quote unquote BMI. Cause like we said, there's flaws with the BMI, but it's a weight that lowers your risk of diabetes, of hypertension, of the obesity um, co- um, conditions. I used to use the term comorbidity, but my um, friend who is not a doctor recently pointed out to me how horrible that sounds. So yeah. I'm trying oh, to oh, avoid using point. the term co- comorbidity. She's like, what is a comorbidity? Uh, yes. <laughs> so it, it, I'm trying to say obesity-related condition. Obesity-related condition. <laughs> you know, I, I love that. And it is especially because I know you talked about hypertension, you <laughs> talked about uh, high blood pressure, you talked about diabetes. Now, uh, a lot of times, and, and you 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 know much more than I do. When whenever you start hearing these disorders, a risk factor always gets labeled as, oh, if you're obese, you know what, you got a, a higher chance to get X, right? If you're obese, you have a higher chance to get this. Like, uh-huh. is that more of a function of the genetics at play, or is it just a matter of patients who happen to be obese are more likely because of everything else? Yes. So it is. Um, so certainly having a genetic family history of it already is going to even compound to that risk. But independently, having obesity or having that um, excess central fat um, distribution, having that um, excess um, body weight or body fat is going to put you at risk for those things, for diabetes, for hypertension, for even certain types of cancers. In postmenopausal women, um, having obesity puts you at risk um, for having breast cancer, um, also uterine cancer, colon cancer has been associated with it. So there actually have been 236 diseases associated with obesity. And you can look that up at the Obesity Society, but there are several, like there are hundreds that have been associated with it independently, so not just um, with it. And and I'm doing a disservice because I'm focusing so much on the metabolic and other things, but even um, mental health issues Mm -hmm. such as depression as well. Um, If you have obesity, you're 37% more likely to have um, depression. So... Is it, there are lots of diseases independently associated with it, and, and, and it's funny, when with the with the, with the with the training, right? And uh, obesity medicine being being considered an obesity medicine specialist, mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you had to go through to get to that point to say, yeah, you know what? Like I'm now certified trained. What were some additional things that you didn't necessarily get uh, going to through your internal medicine? Uh, training? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So one, we learn a lot more about the pathophysiology. So that is just what are the um, this consequences or side effects of obesity? How does it actually work? I should say pathophysiology. How does it work? Um, when you have obesity in the body. So we go in detail about the, um, the, the pathways in the body between the brain, the gut, all of this, which I didn't know about when I was in, um, when I trained in internal medicine. We also learn a lot more about the pharmacology. Um, there are several medications that have been approved to treat obesity. And I know before my training, 
I was very hesitant to use these medications because number one, I didn't understand really how they work. Um, there were misconceptions about, is it just a crux? You know, people, right. calories in, calories out. People just need to work harder and exercise more. But understanding the how what how obesity works or the pathophysiology, then it makes sense to use medication, just like you wouldn't tell someone who has asthma to go run a marathon when they're wheezing. Right. I wouldn't tell somebody who has obesity to go try to lose weight um, independently if they've already tried that without giving them the tools to do so. Wow. So that's, so it, that's what my training at getting the board certification helped me. So how we do that is you buy more reading, um, attending conferences in person. They also have fellowships. There's about seven fellowships in the country that people who want to do two years of in-depth training can go and do these fellowships. And that also can prepare you for research to do research in um, obesity medicine as well, too. Now, now, especially, and obviously, again, I think we're, we're both internal medicine trained, but uh, mm-hmm. having to do that additional work to really get uh, the focus and understanding the why and the how, uh, you know, seems to be far and away something that we should be going towards. But of course, most uh, physicians uh, in our position aren't doing it. Is Would you consider that being the reason why it's so hard to lose weight? And on not only is it hard to lose weight for the patient, but so hard for me to tell my patient how to lose weight. Like, do you think that kind of factors in or are there other like co-founding issues that say, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to lose weight because of this as well. Well, I think, yeah, as a medical community, there's still a lot of disagreement, right. About obesity. Is it really a disease? The AMA only recently um, categorized um obesity as a disease. So here we have what is one of our largest governing bodies in medicine, um, which is the AMA, is the American Medical Association. And they only recently said that obesity was a disease. So that mm. means there's still many doctors that are not in AMA or on the society that don't agree with that. And there's several doctors that trained during the time when obesity was thought to be a lifestyle choice um, as well. And I think what we're seeing in medicine, though, though we should be more evidence-based and follow the science of everything, is that we're still um, subject to popular culture where we're still fighting in um, on a larger scale to get people to identify obesity as a disease also. Why do you think it's important for people to say obesity is a disease and not a a lifestyle choice? Um, Because I think it takes the it takes the guilt. It takes the burden off of people. When I explain in clinic that to people, you can literally see like a weight lifted off of their shoulders. Like you are not choosing necessarily to you're not choosing to be in this disease that yes you make food you may choose food choices and things like that but there is something within you that is prompting your body to store up more fat than someone else who would eat the same amount of food that you are or who exercises the same amount as you and it takes some of the guilt and the burden off of of people yeah and and especially and i think you, you touched really uh, on it when you talked about the like the yo-yo dieting and mm-hmm. like what what tends to kind of occur that causes people to kind of go from one diet to the other and then they they're not successful and then they start doing a, a, a term that I, and I've heard a lot and I, I want you to kind of talk about like the emotional eating uh, behind mm-hmm. it like what, what what are some of those ebbs and flows that that people consistently go through time and time again that causes them at the beginning of the year to say, you know what, my New Year's resolution is I want to lose weight. And then come February, March, April, they say, ah, you know what, maybe next year. You know, as this is still such a new field, I think that's one of the places, to be honest, where really 
there's still more work to be done is really learning weight maintenance. You, if you be honest, which this may discourage your listeners, I don't want to discourage them. <laughs> weight loss is actually the easier part. It's the weight maintenance. So actually keeping that weight that you lose off. About 95% of people who go on a diet will regain their weight. Isn't wow. that scary? Wow. What, what percentage? <laughs> 90, <laughs> 95, some studies say, wow. yeah, will regain their weight. So um, that, with that being said, so it doesn't say that you shouldn't try or make it impossible, but it's just saying that you're going to have to work to keep the weight off because what the typical mindset is for any eating plan or restrictive eating plan, which is what we'll define the diet as, like, so a diet is, you know, you restrict certain parts of food or certain types of food or something. Um, so th- what typically will happen is then you'll say, once I get to X weight, or then I can eat what I want to eat again. But what has happened with the body, what our body, so I like to tell my patients, unfortunately, we weren't made to lose weight. Because if you think about this back in caveman days or the stone age, you had a survival benefit if you had excess fat stored, just like a bear, right? Going into hibernation or something. And then it would be good. It's to your advantage to have this ex- excess body fat because, um, if there are times of food scarcity, if there's times as it will prevent you from starvation. However, we weren't, as time has progressed and we're now in food positive states where we have lots and lots of food, our body still is in the stone age in terms of storing fat. So when you gain weight, your set point changes and your body is always trying to get back to that highest weight you were. There are a lot of things change. Your hunger it increases when you suppress what you're eating. Your drive to eat, your hunger, the hormones that stimulate hunger are released in higher levels. Um, so it makes you want to eat more and it makes you, wow. um, yeah, so that you can, everything goes to try. And then your body will also slow down. Your metabolism will slow down so you won't burn the calories as efficiently also too because you're trying to get back up to that weight. So what we know from so things such the, as... Why, why is the body against us? What, what's happening here? <laughs> because, <laughs> because the body slowed down. It's, it's still back in caveman times. I'm telling you, you I, I like to tell my patients, especially my patients that have obesity, I'm like, you would be queen of the jungle. I would be eating. Don't worry <laughs> if we were back then. You would be good. <laughs> You have the benefit, but um, but here now we have to retrain the body. So we're constantly, and I think that's why working with an obesity specialist is helpful or with people who really get obesity, because I feel like it's, it's a game. I like it. It's exciting because I'm almost always trying to trick the body. It's like, okay, once it kind of slows down, we need to come up with something new. We need to do something yeah. different. And it can be hard to do that on your own. Oh, the best thing to do is try to get it with someone like an obesity specialist or with a physician. It could be your family physician because, you know, if you can't find one, um, someone who understands obesity and can help you. Um, also, I believe in a comprehensive th- team. So that would be a nutritionist. Um, also would, is key because, you know, our training in medicine, we don't get much nutrition training. Hmm. Um, T- tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. So a nutritionist is key. Um, also, you need a psycho. You may need a psychologist. You mentioned emotional eating. Uh, there are a lot of emotional issues um, wrapped into obesity. Um, I mentioned the statistic about depression being high, depression rates being higher, anxiety rates being higher, and then even just having abnormal relationships with food. Like I told, said in the beginning, I'm a former, I like to say former, but I'm an emotional eater in recovery because you're mm-hmm. always kind of struggling with it. You have to, um, and basically emotional eating is using food to soothe. So like you use food to treat whatever mood you're in. It doesn't always have to be stress or sadness. It could even be happiness, right? I tell people, um, Food is the accepted drug in our society. You know, a lot of people, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't drug, but you eat. 
And we, especially in the South, we go hard. You're going to (laughs) eat fried stuff, Uh sweet stuff. We like everything extra sweet. And you're encouraged to do that from a young age. So, you know, it's so funny. I remember growing up because I'm Haitian. So I remember growing up and my mom would have like the adult size plates of rice and Mm -hmm. you couldn't leave the table until the rice was done. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, mm-hmm. I don't want, I don't want all this. And they're like, nope, you're not getting any juice. Mm. You're gonna finish this rice. You're not getting it in. And the staple of our our diet was rice, mm-hmm. meat, and blank. Like it was like some type of sauce with rice, the sauce, the meat, and I was like, you were having rice one way or the other, and I was having these big bowls, uh, and you <laughs> couldn't to to the whole plate was done. So I I definitely agree with that sentiment that you know we we definitely encourage eating and. Yeah, no, and just eating a lot from that standpoint. So I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, and I think, too, it's been helpful for me even going through this training as a mom, just for what you said, because I grew up the same way my parent, my background is Liberian so, um, or West African. So my parents, we a lot of rice, and, you know, you had to finish your plate clean Mm -hmm. everything. But what that teaches you is not to listen to your body and listen to your own full, because your body will tell you when you're full, you know, so it teaches you not to listen to when you're actually full, when you need to stop eating and encourages overeating. So um, I now for my own child, I don't make him finish his plate, you know, once he's done, he can just get up and go. He's done. Yeah. And, and yeah, because because I want him to recognize when he's actually full. And the other thing that you mentioned in that, too, which same thing growing up, food was often used as a reward. Right. And that kind of sets that stage for emotional eating early or um, or unhealthy relationship with food early, because then you want to eat when you um, when you're for to celebrate your successes, um, huh. to when you're Let, bored, let's go, to let's go to lunch. Let's yeah, exactly, exactly. Get ice cream, right? Let's have the dessert. Um, one of my favorite books is by a uh, um, expert in emotional eating, Susan Alberts, and she wrote a book called "But I Deserve the Chocolate." <laughs> and hmm. fifty, okay. di- yeah, fifty diet derailing thoughts and how to avoid them and she just talks about you know just our how we program ourselves to kind of believe these different things that sabotage our weight loss efforts so when we talk about the sabotage or with the weight regain which we mentioned earlier i talked a little bit about the physiological so what the body is actually doing to cause you to regain which is those um hormones like the hunger hormones like adrenaline um, leptin, they're being, uh, they're being out changed in balance. I'm sorry to make you hungrier, but then also you have the psychological aspect too, where you, when you have restricted yourself from a diet that you really just want to eat <laughs> that thing that you said that you mm-hmm. couldn't eat too. So when you do get a chance to eat it, you tend to overeat it or overindulge. Wow. Now, I don't want to be all gloom and doom. Sure, there are sure. people who lose weight and keep it up. Like I say, even for myself personally. Let's, let's, let's talk about the 5%. Let's talk about the... <laughs> 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 oh, my gosh. You, too, can be a part of the 5%. I'm watching the show on Netflix right now. I'm going to be so nerdy. But it's called the 3%. Does anybody watch that other than me? None of my friends are watching this. They're all talking about other stuff. Uh, 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 you know what? What, what, t- what is that about? I mean, I it's a I know it's so random because what we said percent. So it's a, it's about <laughs> it's a futuristic society which only three percent of people get to go live in this plush place called the offshore. Then the other ninety seven percent of people live in the inland and in squalor. So everyone goes through this process to try to get to be the three percent. So it's, I like sci-fi a little bit. It's kind of a little okay. bit of sci-fi. He's very scary. But yes. when you talk about the 5%, that's what it made me think of. My <laughs> goal is not, it, we're not living like the 3%. It's possible for more people. I, I, I'm always optimistic um, with the right tools that people can keep off their weight. And, and one of the greatest um, resources we have for this, though, with weight loss um, is if you look at the, it's called the National Weight Control Registry, 
which has been going on for 20 plus years now. And basically it tracks um, anyone who has lost more than 30 pounds and been able to keep it off. Um, and they have them input all their data, like what are their habits? What did they do they do? And so if they were able to keep their weight off for a year, if they put all their information there. So there's some basic characteristics that we can get from those people. So people who are able to keep their weight off for a year, some basic things, they actually eat breakfast, which, you know, is a little controversial now with this intermittent fasting thing but they they eat breakfast they exercise um at least 300 minutes a week 300 minutes if you do the breakdown that's about five hours a week (laughs) so um and so those are the basic characteristics of them and you can if you go to national weight control registry i guess we can leave the link in the um yeah we'll put put the notes because that's definitely uh, I'm, definitely, can, I'm, I'm definitely about to head over there. Yeah. I definitely want to head over there. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah and, it, and they always update they those up, basic too. characteristics of them, too. So, now, do you yeah. find yourself, when you're, when you're taking care of your patients, having to fight through the aspect of the emotional eaters? Like, is that a common... Uh, person you're dealing with on a day-to-day basis or is it kind of like widespread on you know what's some of the biggest issues that you have to tackle well so I do two things so I have my um, primary care practice but I also run a medically supervised weight loss clinic Um, and this in in our clinic it is for patients who have um have severe obesity so that's defined as a body mass index greater than 40 um, and they have, and they usually have some other comorbidity. So I'm usually helping them lose weight to have um, surgery, either bariatric or orthopedic surgery, or even just for personal weight loss. And in my clinic, we do use a restrictive diet, which again can be controversial. But um, I think for the short term gain or benefit, um, of having that weight loss and then getting rid. So what I tell people is I take their focus off of what they're eating so we can focus on why they're eating. So a large percentage of my patients that I see will have emotional eating and I find it helpful to do the meal replacements for a short term just so that they're not thinking about food so much or what they're going to be eating and we can help break some of those unhealthy habits as well. And so the most common trait, so we, we do a screening for emotional eating when they come in. So that is, that's very common. But the other thing that we see is what we call a self-scrutinizer. So pe- someone who's really hard on themselves, um, like with a lot of negative thoughts and a lot of negative self-talk. Um, like I can never do right. I'm never going to lose this weight. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, and, and I would say, weight loss especially lasting weight loss and if you follow me I like I, I like to post on um Facebook live and on Twitter and such but weight loss is 90% mental i would say 90 if that even 95% <laughs> mental <laughs> yeah because cuz it really it, it, it starts in your mind like even for me personally as i talk about that what happened in the clinic um, with the conviction I had, but I also had a lot of negative self-talk around my weight loss, which a lot of people do, you know, like, let's say you're trying to lose weight, you eat that cookie that day and you're like, ah, you can never do anything right. Mm -hmm. Or you don't exercise for five days when your plan was that you were going to exercise every day. You, you're like, man, you're never going to lose this weight. You can't lose. And this is you talking to yourself. Exactly. So, so yeah, what? It's not even like an outsider saying like, oh, I thought you were supposed to be what you're doing. Like, that's we're so- sometimes hardest on ourselves. Wow. So what unlocked my weight loss for me was um, one of my best friends. She was, she said to me, be nice to Sylvia. I like her. And something about that is just so simple. Wow. Like okay. thinking about myself in the third person, you know, like, yeah, I would not talk to any of my friends like this, you know, I would never say go so down on the, I go get down on them because they were not, they didn't exercise or they missed a day of exercise or they didn't eat. So I started to be kind to myself. And when I was kind to myself, I recognized that, hey, if I could only get in 
10 minutes of exercise between working full time, taking care of a 14 month old son, um, you know, having a husband who commuted um, two hours to get to work. If I could only squeeze in 10 minutes of exercise one day, that was something and that's okay. That would, should be celebrated. If I chose to eat grapes instead of a cookie one day, that's good. But if I decided to have a thin piece of cake one day, that was also all right. So being kind to myself allowed, gave me some leeway in, in on my weight loss journey. And I think a lot of people need to most of my patients, I encourage, all of my patients, I actually encourage them to be kind to themselves. That's the first step. I'll have them keep a compliment journal. Be kind Mm -hmm. to yourself. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. I had them actually keep a compliment journal and write a compliment to themselves each day. Like if if they're self-scrutinizers. So it may not, and it doesn't have to be weight related. Like just say something kind to yourself every day. Compliment yourself every day. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. All right. And, you know, see, mm-hmm. lunch learning community, I, I, I definitely want to make sure that you guys are really like taking in a lot of these gems uh, that Dr. Bully is telling us because she is on the money. Um, she, again, I'm, I'm mentally writing notes down myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I came into 2019, again, being that physician who uh, was telling my patient, hey, you need to lose weight who, while also being overweight. And recognizing, mm-hmm. like, yeah, you know what? This is probably uh, not good for the long run. And and l- like you said, I actually ended up getting, like, accountability partners. And Great. unfortunately, mm-hmm. with the schedule as a, an internist and a hospitalist, uh, mm-hmm. all of my accountability partners aren't even around me. Like, some of them are actually in mm-hmm. different states. But mm-hmm. we, we do stuff like post on – we actually uh, post online, actually, on our Instagram page, uh, awesome. fit, the hashtag is fit iotas and every okay okay goes to the gym uh we tag everybody to say hey i'm at the gym and reflexively what that does is if it was one of those days where i was like eh, i don't know if i'm about to go to the gym today and then i get that mention i'm like oh i guess i am going to the gym <laughs> one of those moments, like, <laughs> really, really, like, it really does help <laughs> And I know you talked about like the why, like once a person is able to say like, this is why I'm gaining weight. Mm-hmm. And is it, is it just the compliment? Is that, is that sometimes just enough to get them to start saying like, okay, this is why I'm gaining weight. So this is what I need to do to lose it. Oh, that is a very tough, qu- that's, a, that's a great question. So you're getting to what, like personal motivators, right? How do we motivate people from growing? It's funny because, you know, in medicine um, for smoking cessation, we talk about pre-contemplative, contemplative, yeah. Yeah, readiness to change. That's what yep. it's called. I'm sorry. So pre-contemplative, contemplative, um, action, um, maintenance, and relapse, <laughs> Yep. And that's how I actually think about my weight loss patients and, and or my patients who need to lose weight or who have obesity, right? And that's how I'm going to approach whether or not I can actually challenge them because that motive, and just like with smoking cessation, we know that that motivation has to come from within, right? You can point out from here to tomorrow oh, that yes. smoking is going to cause lung cancer. They have all those the commercials and everything like that. And but until a person finds that podcast, you know that mm-hmm. and every time I talk about disease, I say, y'all, if y'all are still smoking in 20, well, now it's 2019, but if y'all are still smoking, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And they're going to be those people who just want to, they, they're going to keep smoking. I have a patient, uh, uh, we had that conversation, you know, 63, still smoking. I've, I've been smoking almost um, 45 years. And I, and we talk about it every time. Sometimes she rolls her eyes and said, well, I'm the only one who's going to mention it to you. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I say that because with even obesity, I can't convince someone, right? That, and I don't think that should be the role. I can give you the information, but you have to find that internal motivation for yourself to push you over it. Because for the very reason, we all have free will, and there are going to be some people who are not ready to change or ready to accept or that they, 
that they need to lose weight or that they need to get to a healthier weight, so to speak. Yeah, a couple of things I know. I know, and you know, first of all, you've been absolutely amazing. It's you know, it's New Year's, it's the beginning of the year. People, their their resolutions are in. They're ready. They're in the gym. Like, <laughs> can, can you can you give us you know a few tips of yours that you may sometimes tell your patients on how to avoid like the frustration associated with this weight loss, like the the yo yoing. Like, what what are some tips that you say? Hey, you know what? Uh, this is going to happen, you know, in February and March. Like, I want you guys to be aware of it so, you you know, you don't get discouraged. Mm-hmm. Give yourself permission to maybe n- not reach the goal the way that you thought you would or when you would, and but still keep striving towards it. So be kind to yourself. That being said, set realistic expectations. Healthy weight loss is one to two pounds per week. Um, so can we, can we make sure they, they understand that? Yes. Healthy weight loss is one <laughs> to two pounds per week. That is going to be four to eight pounds per month. So these people who you see on Instagram, um, drop in a hundred pounds in two months, three months, you know, right. that is not the norm nor. And, and actually, as we know from like things like the biggest loser study, you remember that biggest loser, mm-hmm. um, that show the biggest loser they did a study because most of those people gained their weight back and not only did they gain their weight back their metabolism really slowed down so that and it was less efficient so whatever food they ate actually made them gain more weight so so drastic weight loss without having some sort of professional supervision to help you keep it off um, or a professional team to help you keep it off actually can be detrimental for the long term for your weight loss. So you need to have um, a team in place if you're going to do that. So don't don't overdo it. So I mean, don't get discouraged if you don't reach or you're not drop. If your friend is dropping 25 pounds per week, or and you're only dropping one or two pounds or a couple of ounces, slow and steady wins the race. Huh. So be kind to yourself realistic expectations, one to two pounds of weight loss per week. Um, Figure out what works for you. So on my Facebook Live, this is what I'm I'm going slow this month and talking about. You need to figure out what works out for you. There are lots of different eating plans, lots of diets out there. And really, to be honest, though you will see different studies fluctuate, which one works, which one doesn't work. By and large, the the healthiest plan is the plan that you can stick to. And I shouldn't say healthiest, but the most effective plan is mm-hmm. going to be the one that you can stick to. Exactly. So you need to figure out what foods that you just can't live without. Um, even if one or two of them to me are in the unhealthy category, like if you know that you need chocolate in your life, then <laughs> I would not, <laughs> I would set, a time frame, you know, that you allow yourself or a percentage of chocolate that you allow. Like for, I know that you can still lose weight with less than 50 grams of added sugar per week. I mean, per day, I'm sorry. So it may be okay for you to have that dark chocolate square, which is only seven grams of sugar, right? If that's going to fix that chocolate fix and prevent you from having this quote unquote cheat day i hate cheat days like why are you cheating on yourself you love yourself treat yourself you may treat yourself but don't (laughs) cheat on yourself right because cheat it says is naughty is bad there's something to it but you can treat yourself you can have that thin slice of cake you can have a little uh, half a cup of ice cream um you know but it's a treat to yourself because when you cheat i find that's when people go over the top with it Versus okay. if you it just doing it. So talk to him. Talk to him. So you hear you hear it here, right? The, the, <laughs> the obesity specialist says, "Stop trying to play us with this cheat day, right? Like why <laughs> why you need a whole day is still bothering." No. Like and that's the thing they it, they go right to the end. It's not like oh, I'm just having a cheat lunch. I'm gonna be good. yes, it's exactly. Like, no, we, the 24 hour span we going in. And that 24 hours can really sabotage your diet. It can because um because to gain a pound, so to lose a pound or to gain a pound is roughly 3,500 calories. Um, so 
so if you in that weekend basically binge, you're going to negate all the work that you did during the week. So choose one thing that you like to treat yourself with. It doesn't have to be food, but if you if it is a food thing, do it in moderation. Pay attention to still pay attention to the sugar content of it, to the fat content of it also. Now, and we, before we let you go, I, I want you to uh t- tell us, right? Tell us the like community what is Fit MD, right? Let us know mm-hmm. what that is cuz and of course, you know, we're snooping on the site. And of course, everyone will, will have <laughs> her links. We'll have all of her links to her lives and everything in the show notes. But please, I need her to tell us what FitMD is. Oh, okay. So FitMD is basically, it's just a, it's a concept that I developed when I was going through my own weight journey. Because I realized that you can't do this on your own. It's fitness inspired through teamwork. And so I use that as a platform just to inspire other people on their weight loss journey as well. So I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, um, and I'm on Facebook and I do Facebook live videos with it. And so I really encourage everyone to develop a team when they're starting their weight loss journey. Um, Start with a healthcare professional. So ideally an obesity specialist, you can look for one of your area using the Obesity Society website or the American Associate, the American Medical, oh, Obesity Medicine Association, I'm sorry. (laughs) And then also the Obesity Action Coalition as well. So we'll have those links down there and you can find someone in your area. If not, you can start with your primary care physician um, and see if they have a good understanding of obesity. Do they think obesity is a disease? Do they understand your risk factors? What resources can they point you to? Um, and yeah, that yeah, would be a good I think that's an important one too because like, in fact, it was funny because last, uh, the sh- I had a show where you know, one of my Lynch and Learn community members said, like, why would I go to my doctor to talk about losing weight? What 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 do they know that the mm-hmm. nutritionist doesn't know? What do they like so and she actually called into question, like, I don't think the doctor knows as much about losing weight as I do anyways. Wow. I would love to talk to her. That's deep. And unfortunately, that may be her experience. There may be truth in her experience, right? Because we said that there are a lot of our colleagues who don't understand mm-hmm. obesity and they don't know a lot about it. But I think that's why we as a medical community should learn about it because it is the one of the most common diseases in the country right now with two thirds of the American population being overweight or having obesity. So it's imperative that wow. the doc, your doctor and I say your primary <laughs> care doctor, yes, <laughs> understand obesity. Um, and what we can offer, what we as physicians um, or healthcare practitioners can offer to the weight loss community is an actual factual understanding of obesity, an actual science-based approach to a lot of the diets and things out there, like is to be able to be an authority on that. And then also um, with medical treatment. So if you do need medication for it and people say, oh, and a lot of times people think that they're cheating if they take medication for their obesity, like in some way. But I tell them again, like how I use the asthma analogy, I say, if you think about weight loss um, as a race, so to speak, if you have any sort of comorbid condition, if you have any sort of health condition, including obesity, um, or diabetes or thyroid disease, when you're started way behind the starting line for the weight loss race and trying to reach the same finish line as everyone else who's starting at this original start line. So all the medicine does is bring you up to the starting line with everybody else. You're still going to have to do the healthy eating. You're still going to have to exercise, but we're going to help your body process the hormones and neurotransmitters, put everything in line 
in a better way so that you actually are on an even and fair playing field with everyone else who doesn't have those medical conditions such as obesity or diabetes, thyroid disease, anything that could be contributing to your excess weight. So that's what a physician can do. That's what we offer. You're right. There's dietitians, there's personal trainers, there's coaches, there's you know a plethora of people mm-hmm. um, that are in this weight loss thing. But I think we have uh, um, we have the expertise um, in that we understand the science behind it and are going to find something that will be safe and effective for you. Love it. Now, when when can they catch your Facebook lives? Oh yes, <laughs> my goal. See, we all have goals. So yes. my Uh-oh. my goal for 2019 is to post something on every Sunday. And so I, that's when I, you can see me on Sunday on my main, on my page, Dr. Sylvia Gonsimboli, MD. I will post something to make sure that you are equipped going into the week um, for your weight loss. Oh, you, you hear that lunch and learn community. She's made that affirmation. She's put it out mm-hmm. there to the world. She's held us. Put it out. I'm holding it. I'm trying to be like you, Dr. Barry, consistent. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's my goal for 2019. Uh, first of all, we want to just thank you for taking the time to uh, honestly really educate us and you know get our mind right 2019 is here uh, new year's resolutions are locked and loaded and i think people are going to come away from this show and this episode uh ready right to be at the end to be in that five percent right i think i think they they were going to take some of these tips and say okay you know what she she got me together she got me she got me correct and i, I know what i need to do to, to get on now, a question: Do you? T- do you, I know uh, where, where are you located? Um, right now, I currently practice in Richmond, Virginia. Now, do um, you have like, uh, t- like, do you like telemedicine? Is it or is it just local patients? Like, is there a way for someone not in your area to work with you? Unfortunately, no. Um, right now, I'm just based out of a clinic. Um, so. That's where I am now, but stay tuned. Things always are changing, I but I'm, I'm locally based um, in Richmond, Virginia currently. Okay. All right. So, you know, please, please let us know once that changes, because I, I think we have some uh, community members who would love uh, to, you know, to be able to kind of follow your direction and follow your lead. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're going to read your story. They're going to go to your website. So they're going to know, you know, not only is it a person who, is especially trained with this is a person who real life had to go through the transformation had to go through and having to go through again i just had my second child so you Mm. can follow me i'm going to do the same thing that i did the first time but i'm going to be open be transparent with you guys and keep it and take you through my weight loss journey i got about 20 pounds to get back to my um pre-baby weight so We'll do it together like we did last time. And this time is actually a little bit different because um, last time I told you I waited two years to lose weight, um, but I'm doing it right after. So I'm not right, even right waiting. After. So you're not even, yeah. you're like, you know, mm-hmm. we're, not, we're not even taking a little break right now. We're not going to. No <laughs> break. No break. I got, I, I'm so happy I got my first one and a half mile walk in today. So I'm, I'm getting back on track. I'm trying to watch what I eat. Yeah. So, yeah. So we'll do it together, team. <laughs> I'm part of your team, too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. So again, lunch and listeners, again, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time another week uh, listening to an, another amazing guest here on Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. I'm going to see you guys next week. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Barry.